Good to have you back for another one of our online Bible studies. Uh, we are going to be continuing with our From Jerusalem to the Ends of the Earth Bible study, both here online as well as at the end of the week in church, covering the chapters of Acts 24 to 26, just about at the end of the book. Today we're going to be looking at Paul's legal defense, plus a few Get us into that, I'm going to have you take a look at some memorable TV lawyers. Uh, one, if you go back a few years, of course, is Perry Mason. Uh, you might remember him as the one who always won the case, sometimes with some <laughs> rather surprising witnesses that, that showed up. Uh, the other one on TV is Jack McCoy from Law & Order, the, the district attorney who, again, uh, is illustrated on TV as a, a pretty smart guy. And that's just the point that they're trying to make, that this is no Judge Judy that's there for entertainment. Uh, these are some people who were, at least on TV, supposed to know the law, uh, be good defenders or good prosecutors. And, you know, if you're on their side, you've got a, a great chance of coming out on top. And so when we get to Paul today, in Acts chapter 24 to 26, we're going to see him on trial actually three different times, three different judges for some of the same charges. And we're going to find out that Paul was not only persuasive, but also very powerful uh, for himself, uh, for the people that he was giving testimony to, and even to the people that he's testifying to today through the scriptures, you and me. So going on there, we have to go back to our previous session and that was with Paul finding himself in Jerusalem at the end of his third missionary journey. And his enemies caught up with him there. Uh, some of those who had been after him out there in the Mediterranean world. And they were also in friendly turf uh, with the enemies there in Jerusalem. And when they identified Paul as the most wanted man, uh, since he was a follower of Christ and he was the, the main uh, preacher and apostle of Christ, they decided that they were going to do away with him, like they had Jesus and Stephen. But they couldn't do that because in God's wisdom, Paul had been made a Roman citizen. And so he was under their protection, and God dispatched the Roman soldiers at just the right time to rescue him. And so from Jerusalem, they got him up the road to Caesarea, uh, That's what we see in our next scene. And so there at the Roman palace and garrison, Paul became a protected prisoner under Rome's jurisdiction. And in that way, he started what uh, maybe he didn't realize at the time was his fourth missionary journey, or sometimes called the journey to Rome. So there we find him... Uh, under uh, trial uh, at the governor at the time. If you go back to Pontius Pilate, he was a governor at Jesus' time. This governor happened to be Felix. And Felix put him on trial, brought the high priests and the Roman Sanhedrin up the road from Jerusalem to Caesarea for Paul to stand trial before them. And that's where we have his case being tried. Uh, we go there in Acts chapter 24. So, Paul testified there to Felix, I have the same hope in God as these men themselves have, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked, so I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. And what made that such a powerful testimony uh, not just to Felix as a judge, but to Felix as a person, because he spoke of Jesus' resurrection. And he talked about being raised from the dead, uh, all the souls of all mankind in the end, to stand judgment as either one who is righteous before Jesus, or one who would be found wicked uh, without faith, without forgiveness before Jesus. 
And that got to Felix's heart, as it did to some of the other hearers there in the courtyard, because finally Felix had to come to grips with the fact that the resurrected Jesus would be his judge, and he would have to stand trial before Jesus in the end. And really, that applies to you and me as well. Uh, when we talk to people who might be disinterested or distracted like Felix was, you bring Jesus into it, especially the fact that uh, he is the risen Savior that uh, we are living before, living out our lives before each and every day of our lives. And then in the end, we're going to have to stand before him to answer for everything that we've done, either with forgiveness or without forgiveness, that really makes a difference to folks. Uh, so that family member or to that friend that you want to get through to, but who really hasn't been listening. Uh, you can talk about how Jesus, the risen Savior, is the one who is watching everything, who finally is going to bring up everything that uh, they have done before him someday, and that they are either going to have to stand righteous, forgiven by faith, or wicked and not forgiven. Uh, that makes a difference to people. Uh, there's some gentle but persuasive and powerful ways of bringing that up in people's lives that uh, is going to make an impact on them now, just like it was for Felix. Well, Felix was around for two years, but uh, he had nothing to do with Paul. That was Festus. And Festus didn't really want to do, have anything to do with Paul, but he knew that he had to carry out uh, Paul's case. So he talked to the Jews and found out that they wanted to have Paul return down to Jerusalem. And they and Paul both knew that uh, if Paul went back to Jerusalem, there probably would be a way that they could do violence to Paul, even to lynch him like uh, they had done in Felix's time. And so, while the Jews were pressuring Festus to do that, Paul, in his testimony, addressed that in the case that was brought before Festus. And so, in Acts chapter 24, we again hear Paul um, stating his case, and even in this case, making his appeal. So let's go there in Acts chapter 25, where we have Festus wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? And Paul knew what was going on, so Paul right away said in the rest of what you see there, uh, Acts chapter 25, if, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving of death, I do not refuse to die. But he knew that wasn't, wasn't the case. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. And so really, Paul's testimony turned into appeal. Uh, he knew the authority that God had given to him through Caesar as a Roman citizen, and he said, I'm going to use that authority to appeal so that I don't have to lose my life, but instead can go on testifying uh, to kings and to all the others that he would have as, as his audience in, in order to carry out the, the, the testimony, the gospel that Jesus had given him to, to testify about. And I think that really also fits us today as well. Uh, sometimes people make it very difficult, even would try to limit the testimony that our church or that we as Christians have. And yet often we have the, the power of the law that God has given us as citizens of the United States to still carry that out, whether it's in our church or even sometimes outside of our church, uh, in order to proclaim what we have uh, to say, uh, both uh, to the people who come in as well as to the people who are out there in public. And uh, if there's any kind of limits that are put on us there, uh, we should look for every uh, authority that is given to us uh, in the law uh, to use that legally uh, and in a gentle but a powerful way that God gives us to, to let the gospel ring out in all the ways that we can. So we go on to that third trial that Paul had. Um, it wasn't so much a trial as it was 
Festus trying to come up with some kind of charge to send along with Paul when he went to Rome. So it just so happened that uh, King Herod, uh, the local king, came to town with his sister Bernice, and Festus said, would you do me a favor and listen to Paul? So um, King Agrippa, uh, Herod Agrippa, uh, and then also Bernice, as well as Festus, had Paul brought there before them. And now Agrippa was a descendant, actually the great-grandson of King Herod the Great, who had tried to, to kill Jesus, and he was very familiar what was going on in uh, Judea at this time. And so Paul knew that. And he knew that Paul, having an understanding of the way of Jesus Christ, and also now some of the developments that had taken place with Paul, that Paul might have a, a real audience and even an opportunity for King Agrippa to hear what Paul had to say. So uh, Paul wasn't on trial. Paul had a chance to speak before King Agrippa, so he made good opportunity of that. And in your reading uh, this week or in the Bible study, you're going to hear quite a bit that Paul had to say. And some of that is what we uh, turn to there in Acts chapter 26. So we read there. Paul says, so then King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. What he's talking about there is going back to the time when Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus and converted him quite powerfully and dramatically uh, to go from being an enemy of Christ now to being one of the lead apostles. Paul goes on to say there in Acts chapter 26, God has helped me to this very day, so I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, of course, would suffer, and as the first to rise from the dead, would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. And notice he's really making a personal appeal here. First of all, in what he said there, a light to the Gentiles. He's talking about Agrippa and Bernice as being these Gentiles. They were Edomians, um, Edomites, uh, the people who had uh, taken over uh, Judea and now with Rome were helping to rule that area. But it's interesting, even in the Old Testament, in Obadiah, God had prophesied that the light of the Messiah would shine out to some of these people so that some of them would be brought to faith. And Paul kind of looks into Agrippa's heart, maybe even led by the Holy Spirit, to finally say to Agrippa, I know that you believe after seeing all these things. And it's interesting, Agrippa doesn't admit to that, but he says, do you think that in such a short time you're able to persuade me? But he doesn't say that Paul hasn't persuaded him, which might mean that he, like some of those other notables in the Bible, like King Nebuchadnezzar, that we have no indication, became a believer. But there are many evidences that the gospel of the Messiah went to work in their hearts to bring them to faith. It certainly seems as though that light of the gospel shone powerfully into these men that maybe you wouldn't expect to be reached. And again, I think the application for our day and age is for us to be bold in speaking about a risen Christ and even in the way that um, he's at work in our lives, first of all, like, like Paul said, um, he has helped me to this very day. For us to say some of those same things, that, that God has helped me in every way uh, so that I could be talking to you right now as a believer and even about a risen Jesus that wants to be working on you, maybe even has work on you to, to become a believer. Uh, I think about Rick Warden, Rick Warden, Rick Warren <laughs> in the Saddleback Church out in uh, uh, California now, when he started up that church, he didn't have a single soul. And the man that was renting him his apartment uh, showed some interest. And, and so Rick sat down with him and talked to him about Jesus and said, I think you're going to become my first member. And sure enough, he, he was. Uh, I think it's good for us that, well, God says it's good for us to be just as bold when we talk about Christ and when we have a ready audience to tell people, you know, I, I think... I know that Christ is going to be working on you uh, through his message. 
And, and so that's what you have a chance to get into uh, in this reading from Acts chapter 24 to 26, or in the Bible study if you choose to come to that. I, I think you have some powerful testimony for Paul as he stands trial for his faith, just like he makes powerful testimony for us, and as we have the, the opportunity to, uh, to bear witness uh, to the people in this world just like he did. In fact, uh, when you think about how that works for us, I think we can think about Paul's powerful testimony and the way that we think about it and pray about it and even seek to put it into words. And those three things that you see there on the screen, I think, would be Things to keep in mind as you read and as you come to the Bible study and try to apply these words to yourself. That first of all, uh, Jesus' resurrection and, and his judgment is something that we need to keep in our conversations. Uh, I think of some of the needy people that I often talk to, and I, I, I say that there's more to it than the need that they're facing. Jesus, the risen Lord, is with them and helping them uh, in everything that they go through. And someday they're going to stand before him, and Jesus is going to ask them, what impact did I have in your life at that time? And he wants to be able to say that they are forgiven and righteous, uh, that they didn't remain in unbelief uh, as a, a person who's going to be found wicked. And that, that makes an impact on, on people, that they're going to have to stand before Jesus just like they are right now, so uh, they want to get the rest of the story. Or the second point there, that... Uh, God's authority has been given us by our government. Uh, so, you know, when we show up on a person's doorstep, uh, maybe to drop off a flyer or to say something to them, like sometimes I have, and it says no soliciting, I, I'm not going to knock on that person's door and try to talk to them, even though I'm, I'm not soliciting, trying to sell anything. But what I am going to do is use the opportunities that I have to, to drop off maybe postcards down at the public school that they allow me to put out, that they even sometimes distribute. Uh, even though some people might say, you shouldn't be doing that at a public school. Uh, I've got the right to do that. The public school says, we're going to do it for you, just like any other um, person who's uh, supporting the community. Uh, so so I, I have that authority. And we have many other authorities that God gives us to, to uh, spread the gospel. And then finally, that, that last point, uh, your experience of God's power for you and in his gospel uh, for others. Um, makes such a difference uh, for us to be able to talk about what we maybe went through COVID in, in COVID and to say, you know, in, in certain ways, God has paved the way for me through it and has blessed me, uh, even brought me closer to him because of that. And I think we all have specific examples of that. It's important for us to share that when other people sometimes express frustration or are looking for us for some kind of evidence that, that God is helping them in spite of the struggles and the obstacles that they're facing. And it all goes back to Jesus risen and at work in our lives. And finally, not for him to be making our life so great here in this world, but always by hoping not, holding out to us um, the, the, the opportunity for his blessing, but even greater than that, uh, the opportunity for the glory that we're going to share with him someday because of COVID, or really I should say because of the ways that he has shed his light, his blessing, his person, his power because of what we're going through during COVID. So look for opportunities of uh, being able to talk about Jesus in that way, and then also to uh, have people see him in his life as well as in theirs. Thanks for joining us today. I look forward to maybe having you online or even in Bible study this coming week. God bless.